Introduction of Little Busybodies The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees, and Other Busybodies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Busybodies by Jeanette Augustus Marks. A Word to the Children and the Wise we hope that the children who read this book will like the boys and girls who are in it they are real and the good times they have are real as any boy or girl who has lived out of doors will know and the stories are true peter is not always good but do you expect a child always to be good we do not sometimes too the frolics turn into a scramble to catch a dragonfly that will not be caught and there are accidents also betty and jack work hard to win a prize which the guide gives to the child who learns most about ants of course it would be impossible for five children to go in search of locusts grasshoppers crickets katydids dragonflies mayflies leafhoppers lacewings, caddisworms, butterflies, beetles, bees, wasps, and so many other six-legged creatures that among them they have wings and legs enough to fill a new Pandora's box, without having a good deal happen. And a good deal does happen. It is all true enough, and every word about the six-legged busybodies is true as true the other books too that come after this in our story told science series will be every word true and we who wrote this book well we too have been children we used to climb trees and turn somersaults why but that is another story and we remember so well what it used to be like to have to learn dull things we did not wish to know so we said to ourselves as we looked over our spectacles at each other now they shan't be told a single uninteresting fact they shan't be dull poor dears as we were so long ago before we put on spectacles and began to call ourselves wise and so, although we sat down and wrote a book just about long enough for a school year's work, although we felt very proud because our stories had more wonderful six-legged creatures than any book written for children, although we took pains to have in the book only such little creatures as any one of us could see any day, although we hoped that mothers and teachers would say, at last this is a book the children and i can like and find useful or there that will help as a starting point to tell about the bees and the flowers or this story about the flies will teach the children what it means to be clean although i say we hoped all these things yet our chief hope was that we might give all sorts of children a good time so we put our spectacles on and looked very wise and took a quantity of ink on our pens and began to write and we wrote and wrote and wrote and part of the time while one of us was writing and hoping the stories would be so interesting the children would want to write about them too the other was drawing and labeling each sketch so painfully that any child could understand it even if the ears were quite where they could not be expected to be or there were more eyes than seemingly one creature ought to have or wings and legs served to make music as no sensible child could possibly guess and now we can't do better than wish you a good time before we say good-bye we wish you to enjoy all the frolics to feel how jolly it is to be out of doors in the woods 
and fields and lakes, climbing, canoeing, picnicking, and swimming. But still more, we hope that you will realize that more wonderful than the most wonderful fairy story ever told is the marvel of the created life of these little insects. We want you to come to know something of their joys and troubles. We want you to learn how to be kind to them and how they may be useful to you. And we want you to find out for yourselves the places they take in the great plan of creation. In other words, we want you to think and feel about the lives of these six-legged busybodies and see for yourself how much even a butterfly can add to the interest and beauty of living. Does this seem a little like a sermon? Well, you see, we forgot we had kept on our spectacles so long, and somehow spectacles always turn into sermons. Perhaps it is because both begin with the letter S. And now, this is all of our short word to the wise. We expect to make each one of our books better than the last, and you can help us to do this by writing any suggestions you may have. We shall be glad to hear from children, big or little. J.M. and J.M. South Hadley, Massachusetts, January 27th, 1909. End of introduction. Recording by Lynette Geisel. Chapter One of Little Busybodies The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees, and Other Busybodies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine. Little Busybodies by Jeanette Augustus Marx. 1. The Journey. It will be stories all summer, won't it? said Betty to her mother. Yes, dear. And hunting too? said Jimmy. Hunting with your new gun and hunting with your camera. Jimmy unfastened the case of his new camera and looked in. What a beautiful one it was, and what pictures he meant to take, and how the camera would impress Ben Guile. Jimmy looked about proudly. He knew no other boy in that whole great train had a camera like the one his father had given him. Mother, when will it be lunch? asked Betty. Lunch, and so soon. I'm hungry as a bear, declared Jimmy. And here Kitty meowing, she's hungry too. Betty looked at the big round basket whose cover kept restlessly stirring. Did you leave something in the baggy car for Max to eat? Mrs. Reese asked Jimmy. Yes, Mom. It's one o'clock. Can't we have something now? As late as that. No wonder you chickens are hungry for... Chicken! squealed Betty. And ham sandwiches, added Jimmy. And chocolate cake. And root beer. And peppermints. Shh! said Mrs. Reese, or everyone in the car will know what little piggies you are. Ask Lizzie for the basket. Every minute the air was growing cooler. The children could smell the pine woods, and once in a while the train flashed by a great big sawmill or a lake set like a sapphire in the deep green of the forests. And the hills were rolling nearer and nearer in great shadows. The children ate their luncheon contentedly, looking out of the windows and thinking of the mountains there would be to climb, the ponds, the streams to fish, the pictures to take, and the stories they were to hear the summer long. Mother, said Betty, eating her second piece of chocolate cake, Mother, what will Ben Guile tell us this summer? Let me see, said her mother. Perhaps it will be about the little creatures, grasshoppers and katydids, butterflies and bees. Goody! Pooh! said Jimmy. I don't see what you want to know of those old things. I'd much rather hear about porcupines. There isn't anything to say about a grasshopper except that it hops. Isn't there, my son? Well, that shows that you don't use your eyes. 
suppose someone said there was nothing to say about you except that you whistle well what is there about an old grasshopper anyhow i don't know but ben will but tell us something mum urged jimmy who loved his mother dearly and was certain she knew more than anybody else in part because she had been to college but chiefly because she was his mother let me see said mrs reese i shall have to think about it both of the children came as close to her as they could while she continued what a strange world it would be if there were no insects in it we should have no little crickets chirping in the sunny fields or in the dark corners and cracks of our houses there would be no katydids singing all night no clacking of the locusts in the tall grass along dusty roads no drowsy hum of bees there would be no little aunts and big aunts digging out underground tunnels and carrying the grains of sand as far from their doorways as possible there would be no brightly coloured moths and butterflies flitting from flower to flower we should find no sparkling fairy webs spun anew for us every morning but mother all these creatures aren't insects said jimmy yes they are dear it is hard to believe that they all belong to the same family called insecta but they do mother what's that word mean it doesn't mean anything more than cut up into parts you see buddy all these insect bodies are made up of separate rings joined nicely together if you look carefully you will find that behind the head there is another distinct part this is called the thorax which means chest behind that there is a pointed part of the body which is called the abdomen then if you look again you will see that all these little creatures are alike in that they have six jointed legs and are they all good like the bee and the butterfly asked betty who wasn't always a good little girl herself and who thought it would be much nicer if insects were naughty sometimes not all dear answered mrs reese some do us real service but others are troublesome insects are such hungry little fellows and they don't have chocolate cake every day to keep them from getting hungry they are hungry when they are babies and hungry when they grow up some eat all they can see like a little boy i know and some prefer the tender leaves and twigs some care only for the sweet sap flowing into the new leaves and buds and still others like best the tender new roots of plants mother what are the baddest ones asked betty Pooh! i know said jimmy the beetles are because they eat everything why they would eat the buttons of your coat or the nose of your face or jim jim do tell the truth the beetles and bugs too are the most troublesome many of the bugs are such tiny little creatures that it is hard to realize that they can hurt a plant but bugs have sucking beaks with these beaks they bore into the leaves or the buds of the plant and then by means of tiny muscles at the back of the mouth they pump up the sap to be sure one little pump could do no harm but think of millions of little sucking beaks millions of little pumps busy at work on a single plant do you remember the pansies mother had in the winter and how they were all covered by green plant lice well those are bugs called aphids you remember they were pale green just the color of the plant and so transparent and soft they looked almost harmless the scale insects are very troublesome too but mother doesn't know anything about them oh i know what they are announced jimmy they get into the fruit trees and sometimes into shrubs too mother has heard of a scale insect out in california which has been a great nuisance to fruit growers a certain ladybug finds this cottony cushion scale a tender morsel so many ladybugs were taken out there to help the owners of the fruit farms get rid of the scale did they carry them all the way out mother yes answered jimmy they got a pullman car for them and mr and mrs ladybug and family travelled in style mother tell jimmy to be still betty not unlike other little sisters hated to be teased by her brother and now let me see said mrs reese i don't know that i can tell you any more until i know more myself yes i do know what baby beetles are called 
They are called grubs, and they live in the ground until it is time for them to turn into grown-up beetles. While they are babies, they eat as much and as fast as they can, as no baby but a beetle should. The more they eat, the sooner they come out into the bright world as a June bug or some other kind of beetle. They eat all the tender little roots they can find. This is very nice. For Marianne, but rather hard on Abraham. You horrid boy, said Betty. You don't even let me hear a story in peace. It's very nice what, mother? It's very nice for the little grubs, but it's rather hard on the plants, for if too many roots are nibbled away, the plants die. The caterpillars are great eaters, too. Betty leaned over and whispered something to her mother. Then they both giggled. "'I know what you're saying,' said Jimmy. But after that he was quieter. "'Sometimes a caterpillar will thrive on just one kind of plant. It may be carrot, it may be milkweed. On that it feeds until it has grown as large as possible. Then it spins itself a nice silken cocoon, or rolls itself up in a soft leaf and takes a long, long nap. And now it is time for us to take a nap too, for we shall soon reach Bemis, and then there will be still two long lakes to cross and a carry to walk. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of Little Busy Boys: The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees, and Other Busy Boys. This is a liberal recording. All liberal recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit liberal.org. Recording by Sorosha Tawasin Surogun. Little Busy Boys by Jeanette Augustus Marx. Chapter 2 Wrenchley Village. The next morning, great water stirred in the town, for it was known by the village children that Betty and Jimmy had come, and by the grown ups that Mrs. Reese was there. All winter long, the children had looked forward to their coming, for it meant jolly times, picnics, parties, expeditions, and games. Then, too, Benji would begin to tell them wonderful things. Through the winter, she had been teaching school, and it was only when the ice broke up in the big lake and the beavers decided to stop sleeping that Benju came back to his guiding. There was great excitement about Turtle Lodge. Lucy kept flying out with rocks, and then forgetting that they hadn't been brushed and flying in again. The cat was playing croquet with the balls and spools of an open work basket and Max had discovered an old straw hat which tasted very good to him. Only Mrs. Reese kept her head and stayed indoors, moving about quietly from room to room, putting the house in that beautiful order which little children never think about. Out on the grass that sloped down to the street, which, in its turn, tumbled head over hills down to the lake, Benny and Jimmy were playing with their playmates, they were all so wild with joy that every time Jimmy saw another boy, he shouted, Come over! When the boy was coming, anyway, just as fast as he could. Up, up from the foot of the lake climbed it an old man. Up, up, up the steep street he came. His white hair shaking and shining in the brisk June breeze. His long white beard caught every once in a while by the wind and tore sideways. Mother, called Jimmy, Benjo is coming. Out came Mrs. Reese to greet the old man. Then, one by one, the children spoke with Benjo. You are having a good time before you can say, Jack Robinson, aren't you? Yes, sir, came in a chorus of voices. Tell us a story, tell us a story. Not today, said the old man. Why you want a story before you have had time to turn around? Betty stuck her head out from behind her mother. Mother said you would tell us about crickets and moths and everything. Well, 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 murmured the old man. Did she? But I can't tell a story today. I will tell you, though, something so that when you come to collect the little creatures, you will know what to do. Or sit down. 
They all sat down cross-legged on the ground, the old man in the middle. Here you, big Jim boy, catch me that butterfly. There was a wild rush, and the bright wings were soon caught. There, you have torn off one of its legs, said the old man. Jimmy looked troubled. I didn't mean to, sir. Do you know how it hurts to have your leg torn off, boy? Do you know children? No, came in a chorus. The guy took out a piece of paper and drew a pictures on it. There, every part of that little fellow's body I have drawn has muscles, such fine muscles, no naked eye could ever see them. I will show them to you under the microscope in my cabin. Those muscles move the body, and each muscle is controlled by threads, still more fine, called nerves. The old man reached out like a flash and pinched Jimmy. Out! cried the boy, and there was a shout of laughter from the children. You failed that? I guess I did, said Jimmy, sulkily. Well, that's because you are made to be the same way this butterfly is. When anything hurts us, it's because some of our nerves are hurt, and quick as a flash, the news travels to the brain, and we try to get away from the thing that causes pain. A pinch, perhaps, or still worse. The hurt of a poor leg that has been torn off. But a butterfly hasn't any brain, objected Jimmy, who was still cross. Hasn't it? Well, we'll see. Now you wash my pencil. He pointed to the head of the butterfly. This little fellow has a very tiny brain there. Also running through the body from end to end is a little tube through which the food passes. It is in the head above this tube where the tiny brain is, and from which two little threads run down around the tube and join to form another little knot of nerve cells, like that of the brain, then from this second one there runs a series of little knots united by fine threads, the entire length of the body, one in each ring of the body. Do you understand that? Yes, popped it up Betty. Mother told us an insect is made up of rings, and, and... She stammered, surprised at her own boldness. The word means cut up into parts. Good. Why, that's a real bright girl. Well, from each one of these knots, nerves go to the muscles of the body. It's just like a lot of feet on a string, said Hope Stanton. So it is, child. So, you see, if we handle an insect roughly, squeezing it too hard, or breaking a leg or wing, a message is sent to one of these little beads or knots or nerve cells, and the poor helpless creature suffers pain. But I didn't mean to hurt that butterfly. No, of course you didn't. The only way to do, said the old man, is to catch them in a net. Make it of bobbinet with a rounded bottom, sewing it to a wire ring and fastening it to a handle that is the right weight and length for your arm. But then, after you caught it, how could you keep it, sir? asked Betty. There are two merciful ways, said the old man, of killing insects, but neither way is safe for children to try. Put a few drops of chloroform on a piece of cotton under a tumbler. Turn it upside down, put the insect inside, it will soon fall asleep without pain. The other is a cyanide bottle. I have one down at the cabin. It must be kept tightly corked and never smelled. The cyanide in the bottle is hard and dry. Several insects may be put into the bottle at the same time. Once there, they die very quickly. After large insects are killed, the wings should be folded over the back and they should be placed in a little case like this. See, I'm folding a piece of paper to form a three-corner case. Then I bend down one edge to keep the little case closed. At the moment, out flew Lizzie with a curtain which she was going to shake. Here, here, shouted the old man. Don't shake that. Catch that caterpillar on it. I want it. Lizzie made a good nature grab at the caterpillar and then there was a cry of pain. Oh, Begora, Begora, I'm stung by webs. I am, oh. But she still kept tight hold of the caterpillar as she danced about. 
No, said the guide. You are not stung by any web. Bring me that. They are all in your hand. You see, the caterpillar stung you. Oh my, what a beauty! exclaimed the children. But caterpillar don't sting. Oh yes, they do, continued Benjo, with a twinkle in his eye. Ask Lizzie. Lizzie was looking at the palm of her hand, which shone how badly it had been stung. Now, you see, we will need something to pick up this little creature with, a pair of forceps or something of that kind. At least, you must be very careful. And what else do we need? asked the children. A little hand lens will magnify the small parts of an insect a great deal. It will show you all the tiny hairs on the body and the little rings and the feelers and the facets of the eyes and many another wonderful thing. What are we going to put a box in? inquired Jimmy. Let's see look at your small wooden box, said Mrs. Fish. Lizzie went off grumbling something about guys and bites and insects. But soon she came back with a nice box, and in a minute all the children's heads were clustered about Benjil's as he showed them how to line the box with a layer of cork, how to steam the insects a little if they were dry, and then how to put the long slender pins through the chest of the insect and stick it into the cork. End of chapter 2 Recording by Surosha Tha Wan Sin Surakun Chapter 3 of Little Busy Bodies The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees, and Other Busy Bodies This is a liberal recording. All liberal recording are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit liberalwalk.org. Recording by Sarosha Tawansin Surakun. Little Busy Bodies by Janet Augustus Marks. Chapter 3 The Little Army. Benji shook his head, as his hair was long and white, and his hands moved with his head just as if he were a lot of dry branches moving in the wind. It was enough to frighten little Betty. Plague of Egypt, plagues of Egypt, he kept muttering. Now Betty had been to school a long time. I think it must have been as much as two whole years, which is a very long time for school and a very short time for climbing trees. Now Betty had been to school and knew better. She crept behind a big beech tree, but she stuck her little head out and said in a trembling voice, It was locust, sir, wasn't it? And wild honey? Betty wasn't at all certain that any kind of honey could be a plague. It was locust, child. Yes, you are right, answered the old man. Locust it was, but you eat wild honey. Betty came out from behind a tree and whispered, You eat them both? So men did in the Bible, said Benjil, and washing his sugar pills and putting his maple sugar camp, a very sweet place for a little girl to be, when there are still piles of maple sugar packed away on the shelves. In order for the summer, in all her short life, Betty had never known another old man like him. In the winter, he taught school. In spring, he made maple sugar. In summer, he was guiding about the ponds or looking up into the trees most of the time, and in the fall, he cut wood before he went back to teaching. But what was all this of all to Betty was that he knew the squirrels and deer and rabbits as well as he seemed to know little girls or little boys. There was a story told in those woods about his taming even a trout. So that one morning, it hopped out of the water and followed him everywhere he went. Hop, hop, flop behind him. And in the evening, as Benju and his tame trout were passing by the pond again, the trout fell in and was drowned. But dear me, that is a fish story. And you mustn't believe any fish stories whatever except those your father tells. Still, if your grandpa is fond of fishing, you may believe his fish stories too. Betty came out farther from behind the tree. Please, sir, do you eat grasshoppers? Not yet, my dear, 
the old man's eye twinkled. I knew a little boy once, but he was wondering whether this old man had ever been a little boy himself. I knew a little boy once who wasn't afraid to swallow even a caterpillar, but I think that little boy never thought of eating grasshopper. The old man shook his head gravely. No, not a grasshopper. Please, sir, said Betty, coming right up to his bucket he was washing in the brook. Please, sir, do you know any stories about grasshoppers? Benji led his finger along his nose and thought. Betty was sure he knew a hundred million stories, and that he could tell her something about anything she might ask for in all the world. Well, once upon a time, the old man began, there was another old man who was a great deal wiser than I am, and a great deal richer, my dear, for he owned a whole kingdom and lived in a palace, and his name was Solomon, called out Betty dancing up and down out of pride in her own wisdom right and this other old man said there are four things which are little upon the earth but they are exceedingly wise the ants are a people not strong yet they prepare their meat in the summer the conies are but a feeble folk yet make they their houses in the rocks the locusts have no king Yet go they fought all of them by bands. The spider take it hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. But that's not a story. The guy shook his head. You don't know a story, child. When you hear one, it began. Once upon a time, didn't it? Yes, sir, but please tell me another. Well, there are others in the Bible, my dear about locusts and grasshoppers but please sir said betty who was almost ready to cry she was so teased please tell me one of your own stories benji began to swash his bucket up and down up and down in the stream until the water very rocked then he pulled the bucket out of the water set it beside him and reached out after a locust here it is there was a long pause. Betty thought he would never go on. Well, once upon a time there was a little army, and all its uniforms were brown and green, and from the meanest soldier in the ranks to the lieutenant commander, this little army was made up of insects who belonged to the same tribe. Let me see. There were the grasshoppers and the locusts and the katydids and the crickets please sir were they cousins i think they were my dear yes first cousin and unlike even my first cousins they all have wings and straight wings like this the guy gently spread out one of the wings just where the back of your chest is this wings grow two pairs of wings my dear and two pairs of wings mean a good deal more than two pairs of new shoes this first pair is straight and narrow and hard, because is it meant to cover the gussy wing underneath? Puff! Away flew the locust. You see, he doesn't use his first pair, but holds them up straight from his body while he spreads out the gussy ones like a... like a... Fan! shouted Betty, quite forgetting the tiny squirrel who had come up near her, and at her shout nearly jumped it out of his little red jacket a yellow fan said the old man and some have a red fan well i think said he reached for his pair there isn't going to be any more of this story not any more but there must be more sir i have seen hundreds and hundreds of them in a dusty road and please they are just the color of the dirt the guy shook his head not today by this time, Betty was so eager to have him go on that she had forgotten all about being afraid of him. And when they were up from the road, sir, they say, clack, clack, clack. C -c -c -c. The old man make a sound like the noise of a locust. How does it make its mouth move, sir? It doesn't make its mouth move, child. It make the noise by striking the edges of gusty wings and hard wings covered together. See, this way. 
the old man struck his arm and leg together. It has another fiddle too. We should use it when it makes the long rasping drowsy sound of summer days. Then it rubs the rough edges of its hind leg against the edge of its wing copper. Please, is it happy then? asked Betty. Just as happy as a healthy locust who lives in a long, sweet-smelling grass and is contented with his own singing can be. And that is very happy. Oh, said Betty, it doesn't use its mouth. Then Jimmy said it did. Jimmy is a stupid boy. See this fellow. The old man held the locust toward Betty. With his upper lip broad, you see, and there is the lower lip made into scallops and there's a short feeler on either side, and another pair of soft jaws with a feeler hidden away under those part in a pair of dark brown, horny jaw which open like two big swinging gates. What makes them so big? The better to eat you with, my dear. The guy worked his jaw until Betty, half afraid, half pleased, screamed and ran behind the tree. Oh, how they can eat, roared the old man. More than any little girl or boy I ever knew. Years and years ago, when your mama was a baby, they mounted up into the air from the rocky mountains and flew eastward in a great cloud. Down the swoop did upon the fertile valley in rusting hordes and ate everything in sight, grass, grain, vegetables, and bushes. They ate and ate and ate until they had eaten a fifty million dollars worth of food, and the poor farmer could hear nothing but the sound of the shearing of those ever-swinging jaws. Now, be off, little girl, or my pails won't be clean. Oh, please, sir, just tell me how they jump and breathe. There, there, see this fellow. He had wet a little grain of maple sugar and a tiny meadow grasshopper which had alighted on his knee was pushing the sweet stuff into his mouth with both four legs. Child, you must never, said the old man savagely, push your food in that way. Please, sir, answered Betty. I never do because I eat with my fork and my knife. Please, sir, are they happy when they jump? Look like a horse, isn't it? Asked the old man. It's made for jumping. Think of all the training it takes to make a jumper of your brother at school. Well, this chap can jump ten times as far. Is born with a better jump than the longest leg boy you ever saw. But the locust might get his head cut off when jumping if it weren't for this little saddle that covered the sole part of the neck. Mr. Locust can't always look before he leaves, as a little girl can. And the knife edge of a blade of grass would cut his head right off if it weren't for this saddle. See, here are his long leaping legs and on the back of edge of this are some spines to keep it from slipping. And the feet are padded with several soft little cushions that keep it from shin chopping itself to pieces when it lands after a long jump. And here, my dear, a little rest leg, just behind the front legs. With this, Mr. Locust hangs on to a blade of grass when tired. A fine idea, child. Every little boy and girl ought to have some rest legs, like the locust. And the locust has some extra eyes, too. Benji was going so fast, now that Betty was listening to him, mouth open, as he pointed with a blade of grass to one thing after another. You see, the locust has two big eyes, and there in the middle of the forehead, it has three little eyes, and with five eyes, there isn't much it can't see. And here on the body are two tiny shiny oval windows. There are ear laps, and that, my dear, is the way it hears, and upon the sides of the body, the thorax, that is, just the chest, and his abdomen are tiny holes. The air enters through this, and that is the way Mr. Locust breathes. Oh, said Betty, then it hasn't got any nose? I thought everything in the world had a nose. And this little body, the old man went on, is as strong as a grub hole. With it, the locust makes holes in fence rails, logs, stumps, and the earth. And in those holes, mother locust lay her eggs. See, those four spines are for boring holes. With these, Mrs. Locust bores a hole in the ground. And then, with these same spines, she guides the bundles of eggs into the hole and covers them up with a gummy stuff. There, the eggs stay until the next spring. When, my dear, 
out comes a little hopper with no wings. And this little hopper is called a nymph. It grows and split its skin, grows and split its skin, and with its new skin, it has five or six skins and leaves all its old clothes hanging around the bushes. Its wings grow bigger. At last, it flies off just as its mother and father did a year ago. Benju tossed the locust into the air and called out, Shoo! Clapping his hands loudly together, out from the woods came two baby deer. A wise, gentle old cow. From the cabin came a mother cat and three kittens, and a big black dog, and from the trees scampered down a half a dozen squirrels. Time for dinner! Betty went up to him and whispered something in his ear. The old man nodded his head solemnly, and the little girl went trotting along the path to Rangeley Village. End of chapter 3 Recording by Sarosha Tawans in Surakun Chapter 4 of Little Busy Bodies The Life of Crickets Ants Bees And Other Busy Bodies This is a liberal recording All liberal recordings are in the public domain For more information or to volunteer Please visit LibriVoc.org Recording by Sorosha Thomas in Surukun From Bangkok, Thailand Little Busy Bodies by Jeanette Augustus Marx Chapter 4 Fiddlers There was the greatest scurrying around in the fields on the edge of the wood about Benju Kevin. Little girl and boys were flitting hither and thither with pretty nets and small boxes strapped over the shoulder. Inside the boxes, they seemed to be just as much hopping about as there was outside. By and by, the guy put his head out of his cabin door and called, How many have you? Oh, lots and lots, the children answered. Bring them in. And the child trooped into the cabin which they thought quite the most wonderful place in the world. Its walls were lined with books and cases. The books were not only in English, but also in French, German, Italian, Latin, Greek, and other languages. And the cases were filled with scores of specimens, the most beautiful butterflies, moths, beetles, birds, flowers, and rare stones. The floor of the cabin was covered by different kinds of skin. Besides, there were telescopes, field glasses, magnifying glasses, specimen cases, all with them, and a flute. And by the great wide fireplace, in front of which the guy was cooking biscuits and cookies in a reflector oven, lay several kittens, the old black dog, Thor, and a dappled fawn which Thor was licking. Those crickets sound like pop guns, said the old man, slipping more cookies into the oven and setting a pan of biscuits on a shelf by the hearth. Oh, please, said the little hope. We have got two shells of them. Now we will let those cookies bake while we tend to the fiddlers. Are four pans of cookies enough for five children? Yes, yes. Now, Hope, let me have your bushel box. Mm, he murmured, peeping in. All the rest for the party. What color? Brown, sir. Black, too, said Betty. And on a field, she added, there is a stripe or a weeny spot of color. Woohoo! exclaimed the old man. What have we here? He took a pale little creature from Hope's basket. Why, it's white and green tinted, called Jimmy. That isn't cricket. Isn't it? Well, it's the first cousin which lives in the trees and loves its tree home so much, like the sensible little fellow it is, that it sings tree, tree, as far as that it can trill a summer long, but it is very harmful to the tree because when egg-laying time comes, 
It cuts a long slit in the trees in which to lay its eggs. Just a minute. The old man shifted the position of the baker, and out came such a good odor of cookies that all the children sniffed with delight. Here, Jack, he said to a brown little fellow in ragged clothes and bare feet. You have a zinger in your box. I didn't catch but one, said the lad. Rear on good full bare legs, aren't they? Never mind, your crickets won't eat one another. Eat one another? cried the children. Yes, crickets are cannibals, like some other insects, and they frequently eat a near relation or friend, as the people in the Fiji Islands used to do. This is a nice brown little chap, Jack. Do you know how he makes his music? why i suppose said the boy he opened his mouth the way mr tooker does in the church choir and there was a shout of laughter from jimmy who was sure he knew a great deal well said the guy to jim then how does it make its music since you know not with its mouth then how i don't know sir stammered jimmy who found he didn't know as much as he thought he did when mr cricket sings went on the hermit it lifts its two wing covers so that the edges made like the pointed roof of a house then you little fiddler jack rubs one edge against the other all this time peter bish had been waving his hand about the way children do in school and giving big snips please sir the cookies are burning bless my soul the guy whisked the cookies away please sir said jack are we going to have something soon jack did not look as if he had his share of food to eat for he was as thin as the fawn which had curled up near him jack had twelve brothers and sisters and a father who wasn't what he ought to be so there were times when there was no food for jack yes my son said the guide kindly for the old man could guess how hungry the lad was but first where do you suppose the crickets and katydids have their ears near those big eyes called peter no 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 on the joint of the foreleg is a little membrane which is just a thinner tighter place in the skin of the leg there benjo had the four legs of jack's cricket stretched under the magnifying glass the children could see plainly the film of tight skin underneath the thin tight skin is a fine nerve which when the air makes the skin shake changes the motion into sound mrs cricket listens with her foreleg while mr cricket sings his love song to her at this the children laughed and laughed, and comical little Peter put up his leg as if listening. Here, Pete, give me a box. Do you remember what I told you about Mrs. Slocus, Betty? And the way she lays her eggs? Yes, sir. She has four straight spines at the end of her body, and after she has bored a hole with her body, she guides the eggs in with the four spines good well mrs cricket wears at the end of her body a long spear see this cricket of peter's now she bore her hole with the spear and then guides her eggs carefully into the hole why see here pete what have you got here the children gazed eagerly over the old man's shoulder my isn't it like velvet exclaimed peter and isn't it brown at hope but look at its stumpy front leg poor jack who had forgotten his empty stomach in the excitement about this little creature which looked like a cricket and yet was so different and its little bits of eyes said betty do you know what it is no one knew well it's a mole cricket you rarely ever see one because 
they live underground and bore their way along just like moles. Leaving tiny tracks and nibbling the roots of tender plants, you see? It doesn't need eyes any more than the mole does, but it does need those thick net forelegs to do its underground digging. Now, children, run out into the fields and let your crickets go. Be careful not to hurt them. We will have supper, and after supper, we will catch a kate in it. Out ran the children. Soon they were sitting the long wooden tables under the trees with delicious trout the boys had caught. With hot biscuits and jugs of maple syrup, with berries and cookies, with milk from the old cow who, contentedly chewing her cud, was looking at them through the low crotch of a tree, and with little cakes of maple sugar, which the guy had molded into the shape of hearts. End of chapter four. Recording by Surosha Thawansin Surogun from Bangkok, Thailand. Chapter 5 of Little Busy Bodies The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees, and Other Busy Bodies. This is a LibreVault recording. All LibreVault recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVault.org. Recording by Soro Shata once in Surakun from Bangkok, Thailand. Little Busy Bodies by Jeanette Augustus Marks, Chapter 5 How Katie Did. Never did trout, cookies, and maple sugar disappear so quickly. Never was such appetite, never such laughing, and such interesting stories told by the guide. Hush, said Benjil. Do you hear that? Yes, cried Peter. What is it? It's a katydid, said Betty. Over there. Listen, children. What does it say? It says chick a she, chick a she, over and over again, answered Jack. Poof, interrupted Jimmy. It says katydid, katydidn. It says. Katie broke a china plate. Yes, she did. No, she didn't, called Betty. Yes, she did. No, she didn't. The children shouted merrily together. Well, said the old man, anyway, it's all about what Katie did do and what Katie didn't do. Probably, Mr. Katie, like other good husbands in the world, is singing off the wonderful thing Katie did do and the naughty things she didn't do, that is, Mr. Katie Love Song. Uh, he find Mrs. Katie very charming. Her beautiful wings, her gracefully waving antenna, her knowing shining eyes. Now listen again. Katie did carry its musical instrument at the base of its wing cover. On each side is a tiny membrane and a strong vein. When the wing covers are rubbed together, the membrane speaks, and you hear, Katie did, Katie didn't, shouted the children. Do you think you know where they are? Well, take these lanterns, the guy had light in half a dozen, and find them. The children scurried off, certain of a quick victory in the woods. About a cabin you could hear them shouting, It's here! No, it isn't. Where is it? A will o the whips, murmured the old man. May they never have a harder one to find. By and by, the children came trotting back. They couldn't find a kitty did in any place, and they had looked it everywhere. Couldn't. How did you look? He took one of the lanterns, went a nearby tree, and held the lantern close to the leaves. Here it is. Why, it's a great fellow. The children trooped it into the cabin after him, crowding to look at the katydid. did. I thought they were brown, said Hope. So did I, echoed Betty. See, you can't tell this fellow from the leaf. It is such a bright, fresh green. Woe to the katydid did if it were anything but this bright green. 
Just think how easily the bird would find them. What nice salad Katie would make for a young robin. Do the birds eat Katie did? asked the children in surprise. Oh, yes, and they haven't any stated luncheon or supper time for doing it. They are very informal. One time is as good as another, and the oftener, the merrier. If Katie doesn't keep very quiet and demur like her leafy background, whoosh, and Father Robin or Mother Bluebird has a meal for the youngsters. Is that why it doesn't sing by day? asks Peter. They'll wait till the birds go to bed, I suppose. See what a comical look this fellow has, waving his long, fine, silky antennae about. Probably is trying to find out what it is on, looking out for another nice green leaf to eat. They do a lot of vanish eating leaves from the trees. What's that? asks Betty, pointing to the edge of a leaf. Well, you have sharp eyes, said the old man. Mrs. Katie did has laid her eggs there. See, the eggs are rounded and flattened, and each egg laps a little over the one in front of it. Once another man saw a row of Katie did eggs laid as near as could be on the edge of a clean linen color. I will keep these eggs. Then, in the spring, the young one will hatch out. They will grow and shed their skin from time to time. Just the way the locusts do. <sighs> they leave so many old clothes about that they need an old clothes man. I wish I could tell you about the Katie that I knew once upon a time who spent her days collecting old clothes and how she made a fortune selling them too. Benju paused and sighed deeply. Selling them to what? shouted the children. I can't tell that to you, replied the old man, shaking his head sadly. It's a story of how Katie did. I have to be very careful for Mr. John Barongs, who is a wiser old man than I am, says I mustn't. Lately, the scientist almost killed one man I know, and a good, clever, useful man for telling that story. Very savage, very savage. The children began to look troubled. Will Mr. Barong hurt us? inquired Hope. My papa would... No, no, child, you're too small. He likes something big, and he's especially fond of the big stick. Is that what he does, his beating wit? Jack's eyes were frightened. He hunts with the big stick, answered the guide. Dear me, where are we? It's half past eight and you children should have been in bed this time long, long ago. Hurry, skip! Get the lanterns or we will all be scold. And they scampered for the village, the guide driving them before him, and all the light waving to and fro like so many crazy fireflies. End of chapter 5 Recording by Suro Shata once in Surokun from Bangkok, Thailand Chapter 6 of Little Busy Bodies The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees, and Other Busy Bodies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine Little Busy Bodies by Jeanette Augustus Marx. 6. Fishing. Have you ever started off on a bright, cool morning to fish? At the last, it seems as if you would never get started, which, I suppose, is partly the eagerness to be gone. Then you do get off, only to find you've forgotten the can of worms or the salt for the luncheon basket. Jimmy and Betty were prancing on the lawn in front of Turtle Lodge. Jimmy had his camera over his back, and a jointed steel rod, done up in a neat little case in his hands, on his feet long rubber boots. Betty wore a big straw hat. She carried a little rod like Jim's, and a pretty little knapsack, which held part of the luncheon. They were waiting for Jack and Ben Guile, who were to go with them to fish a stream that lay far back from the pond. It was to be a great day's sport. They had a creel and a rod for Jack, 
for the guide they needed to take nothing, for he had the most wonderful collection of rods and flies they had ever seen. At last they saw him coming up the hill, Jack with him. Hastily they kissed Mrs. Rees and ran shouting and jumping toward the old man and the boy, Lizzie after them, for they had left half the luncheon on the grass. Faith, she panted, catching up with them, and what can you be doing without the victuals, I'd like to know? The guide took part of the bundles and Jack the rest. Off they went, gaily talking and laughing. Soon they were following the stream, Jack catching his line and flying the alders almost every time he cast. Jack was too poor ever to have had any rod, except an alder stick cut beside the stream, a short line and hook, and any worm or grasshopper he might find. He was wonderfully proud of the rod he held. The children meant to give it to him at the end of the summer, but Jack did not know this good news yet. Ben Guile led the way, and almost every time he cast his fly there was a swirl, the end of the slender rod bent, there was a minute of excitement, and then upon the bank lay a beautiful speckled trout. On, on, on they went over the cool green leaves and bright red berries of the partridge vine, and past raspberries, wherever the sun had struck in through the heavy trees to ripen them. The stream was running more and more swiftly as they travelled up grade, quick water was growing more frequent and the pools deeper. At last they came to a deep round pool, and the guide said, Now, Jim, you've the first try. Jimmy cast his fly, there was a strike, a plunge, and out, out, out ran Jimmy's line. The boy's face turned quite pale. What shall I do, sir? You have a big one, answered Ben calmly. If you can play him long enough, we may get him, otherwise he'll get your fly and line. Steady there, steady. Let out a little more line, and now reel in a bit. It seemed like hours to Jimmy as he let the line out and reeled it in again. Really, it was only a few minutes before the guide said, Seems to be getting a little tired. Bring him in closer. That's it. There. They had no landing net with them, so at the last moment Ben Guile seized the line, and out came a two-pound trout. Jimmy's eyes were popping nearly out of his head and Betty was jumping about and clapping her hands. "'Tired?' asked the old man. "'Some,' said the boy. "'Well, this is the best place we shall find to eat our luncheon. We'll camp here. Now for the fire. Boys, get the wood and a small strip of birch bark. Then these two stones will hold the frying pan. Now for the fish. We'll keep that big one of yours, and I'll mount it for you if you'd like me to. We'll eat the little fellows.' After luncheon we must catch more for your mother, Betty, and for Jack to take home with him. Soon the frying pan was hot, and the trout were sizzling and curling up with the bacon in the pan. Never did a luncheon taste so good as that, with fried trout and bacon, and hard-boiled eggs, soda biscuits, and a mammoth apple pie. They listened to the fire crackling. They looked up into the shining trees. They watched the water beyond the pool go tumbling downhill. Finally the old man said, It's going to be a clear day tomorrow. The children gazed up into the sky. At this Ben Guile laughed. Don't look at the sky, look at your plates. Puzzled by this, the children did look at their plates. But there's nothing left to look at, said Jack. That's just it. There's an old saying that people who eat all their food make a clear day for the morrow. Now he continued, I'll smoke my pipe of peace before we go on. Just look at that fellow darting about over the pool. Oh, cried Betty, it's a darning needle, and it will sew up my mouth and my eyes. Oh, oh. Nonsense, child, that's silly. The dragonfly is a very useful and very harmless fellow. It's a pity there are so many superstitions about it. There's another name for it, said Jack. Devil's darning needle. And in the south the darkies call it the mule killer and believe it has power to bring snakes to life. It's all nonsense. They're not only harmless to human beings, but also very useful, for they eat flies and mosquitoes at a great rate. Once upon a time I fed a dragonfly forty houseflies in two hours, 
and they eat beetles and spiders and centipedes, and sometimes they eat one another. Like the crickets? said Betty. Yes, like the crickets. Just see that fellow dart about. The sharpest sort of angles. There, it has something. It caught that lace wing in its leg basket. Leg basket! exclaimed the children. Yes, it draws its six legs together and makes a sort of basket right under its head. Then the dragonfly devours what it catches by these strong-toothed jaws. It is a hungry fellow, it is. The old man puffed away quietly for a few minutes, while the children watched the darning needle and hoped Ben Gile would say something soon. "'Those scientists,' he continued, "'who are working on fly machines could learn a good deal from this fellow. The dragonfly is made for flight. A long, slender, tapering body that cuts the air, moved by four narrow gauzy wings and steered by that pointed abdomen.' They eat, mate, and lay their eggs while they are flying. I don't know that they are still for more than a few seconds. Can you find their eggs? asked Betty. Yes, their eggs are laid in the water or fastened to the stems of water plants. See that damsel fly? The slender, smaller, pretty colored darning needle? Well, it goes entirely under water, cuts a slit in the stem with the sharp end of the abdomen, and lays the eggs in the groove it has made. And they lay thousands of eggs. "'When they hatch out, what do they look like?' asked Jack, who grew daily more interested in the creatures about him, and who, in the years to come, was destined to be a great scientist. "'It looks a little like the mother,' said Ben Gile, taking out his pipe. "'But not much. It goes through a great many changes before it is really grown up.' All told, the growth takes from a few months to a whole year. The young one, called a nymph, is an ugly little fellow, dingy black with six sprawling legs, two staring eyes, and a big lower lip, which covers up its cruel face like a mask. It is a true ogre, lurking under stones and in rubbish at the bottom of the pond, seeking whom it may devour. It eats the smaller and weaker nymphs. "'Oh!' said Betty, studying the picture the guide had drawn. "'What an ugly, ugly fellow!' "'It changes its skin a good many times, "'and sometimes it looks a little better "'while the skin is still clean and light grey. "'But it soon turns dingy again. "'See these three little leaf-shaped gills I've drawn? "'They're like the screw on a steamer,' commented Jimmy. "'They are a little.' Well, this chap uses these gills for the same purpose as a steamer uses its screw, to scald through the water. What happens when it changes? asked Jack. After the nymph has its full growth, some sunny morning soon after daylight, it makes its way up out of the water onto a stem, and waits quietly for the old dark skin to split. Then out crawls a soft-skinned creature with gauzy wings. But the body is so moist and weak it has to wait a while for the warm sunshine to harden the skin and strengthen the muscle. When this is done, the new dragonfly, with its glistening body, flies out from the pond in the bright warm light. "'Then does it live forever?' asked Betty. "'No, it dies after twenty-five to forty-five days of its flight. Here, Jack, catch that fellow.' There was a wild scramble, but every time Jack just missed the dragonfly. Finally Betty lent him her broad hat, and at last Jack caught the insect. Gee, aren't its eyes big? And beautiful, too, said the guide. They are made up of thousands of facets. A facet is just a small plain surface, as many as thirty thousand facets in one eye. Some look up, some look down, some look out, some look in so that there is nothing that escapes the sight of this hawk of the air. Look at the wings on this fellow, and look at the picture I drew for you of the nymph. Well, this fellow's wings begin in the nymph as tiny sacks or pads, made by the pushing out of the wall of the body. Running all through between the two layers of the wing are thickened lines of chitin, which divide and subdivide, forming this fine network. In the new wing, protected by these thickenings, are air tubes which divide and branch into all parts of the wing. But as the wing reaches its full growth, most of the air tubes die. 
the guide paused. We are talking too much and fishing too little. Time to go on. Put out the fire, boys. Be sure that it's out. Run water all around it. Now we're off. And up, up, up the brook they went. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Little Busy Bodies: The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees, and Other Busy Bodies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine. Little Busy Bodies by Jeanette Augustus Marx. Seven. The Swimming Pool. Two or three days after the fishing expedition, the boys had gathered together at the swimming pool, Ben Gile with them. They had been racing and climbing trees, and they were very warm. Come, boys, said the guide, let's sit down a minute before you go into the water. It won't do to bathe when you're too warm. Look round on the stones under the water and see what you can find. Look at this, called Peter. It's just like a sponge. It is a fresh water sponge. I didn't suppose sponges grew in these parts at all, said Jimmy. Oh, yes, there are many of them in the ponds. See this, sir, shouted Jack. What funny little legs it has. That's a mayfly or shadfly nymph. He was hiding carefully under that stone and keeping out of the way of the dragonfly nymph, who would so gladly gobble him up. "'It's prettier,' said Jimmy, "'than the dragonfly nymph you drew a picture of.' "'So it is. See, here on each side of its body are these fine little gill plates, moving, 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 so that they may get as much fresh air as possible out of the water. Each gill plate is a tiny sack, and within these are the fine branches of the air tubes. It's wonderful the way these creatures breathe.' "'Don't they breathe just the way we do?' asked Jack." No, throughout the body of an insect is a system of tiny white tubes. Some day we'll look at these tubes under the microscope and you will see that they are made up of rings. From end to end of the tube is a fine thread of chitin twisted in a close spiral like a spring. It is these little coils which look like rings. The coiled threads hold the little tube open so that the air may pass readily. But your little fellow, Jack, cannot have pores on the sides of the body like the last nymph. It lives under water, and the water will get into its tubes. Instead, it has tracheal gills. That's a pretty big word, said Peter, looking up at the guide. He was growing impatient and wished to begin the swim. If he had known what that swim was to mean to him, probably he would not have been so anxious. They aren't so hard to understand. They are just little oval sacs, inside of which is a limb of the air tube divided into tiny branches. The fresh air in the water passes through the thin wall of the gill and is taken by the air tubes to all parts of the body, while the impure air passes out in the water. This is all that breathing means in any creature, a changing of impure for pure air. Then that is what my nymph is doing, asked Jack, when it wiggles its gill so? Just that. Your mayfly nymph, Jack, hatched from a tiny egg first. But it grows rapidly, and splits and sheds its skin sometimes as often as twenty times. During the last few months, wings appear, which grow a little larger with each shedding of the skin. Finally, after three years, sometimes three years spent in growing and hiding away from its enemies, the little nymph floats up to the surface of the water. In a few minutes the old skin splits along the back, and from it flies forth a frail little mayfly. Its body is very soft and delicate. Its four wings are of a gauzy texture. At the tip of the body are two long, fine hairs. Its jaws are small and weak, but the life of this little creature is so short that it never eats. It flies up into the air with thousands of its brothers and sisters, whirls in a mad dance for a few hours, then falls exhausted to the ground to die. Well, now I think we'd better go into the water, ended the guide. You boys can go in just as you are. 
for three little boys had been sitting undressed in the bright sunshine. Good for their pores, Ben Gile had told them, which is all very true. Soon there was the greatest splashing and padding and shouts of, My goodness, isn't the water cold? Can you swim this way? How far can you go anyway? Jimmy and the guide were swimming around near the shore when suddenly, two hundred feet ahead of them, they saw Peter disappear in what they supposed was shallow water. Jack was halfway the distance between the guide and Peter. It did not take him an instant to realize what had happened. But before he could get to the place where Peter had gone down, the lad had come up, struggled, and gone down again. As he came up once more, Jack caught him by his curly hair, turned him over on his back, holding Peter's head high out of the water, and swam calmly for the shallow place. Once there, the old man took Peter in his arms and hurried to the shore, where they rolled him until they had the water out of him. Not a word was said and modest, quiet Jack did not seem to think that he had been brave. When Peter opened his eyes, he said, "'Guess my pores weren't in the right place.'" End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Little Busybodies The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees, and Other Busybodies this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sash Elliott. Little Busybodies by Jeanette Augustus Marks. Chapter 8 The Rainy Day. It was a rainy day. Poor Betty flattened her little nose against the window panes of Turtle Lodge a dozen times, but outside all she could see were just the long, straight lines of the downcoming rain and an empty road leading downhill to the edge of the pond. All she could hear was the drum of the water upon the roof. Inside, Jimmy was developing films in his laboratory and was not in the least interested in what Betty might be doing. "'Oh, mother,' called Betty, "'I am so tired. There isn't anything to do.' "'Why don't you sew on a dress for Belinda?' asked Mrs. Reese. "'Belinda has too many clothes. She has more than I have, mother, and she's a naughty dolly today.' "'Well, let me see.' Get Lizzie to let you make cake. Lizzie's cross, and I'm afraid to. I wish the guide were here. He's never cross, and never too busy to tell you something that's interesting. Betty looked out of the window. He's coming now! Goody, goody! When old Ben Gile reached the steps, there was a little girl dancing inside the door, and still shouting, Goody! What's this? You'll tell me a story, won't you? Tell you a story? Dear, dear, I never knew such a little greedy for stories. I've brought you something. Betty's face was shining now. She had forgotten the rain, the dreary day, cross Lizzie, and everything. Ben Gile took a box out of his pocket. What is it? she asked. I have a box of little elves for you. Elves? exclaimed Betty. Yes, little elves, little brownies. Come into the study where there is a fire, Mrs. Reese led the way. Then you can tell us all about these elves. They sat down around the fire and Mrs. Reese continued. Don't you think it would be fun to pop corn while we're hearing about the brownies? Betty was delighted and ran for a corn popper, and soon there was the merry sound of crackling wood, popping corn, and happy voices, all sounds that proved so tempting that before long Jimmy joined the others. My little elf is a bug, began the hermit. A bug? An elf? Yes, a bug, and when he doesn't look like an elf, he looks like a king with a high crown on his head, 
or a naughty boy with a dunce cap. Let's see him, please, said Betty. The old man opened his box. Inside lay a lot of little creatures with backs like beech nuts. See, look through the lens. Betty laughed. Oh, aren't they funny? The eyes are so big and so far apart. And the lines on their heads make them look as if they were gazing through heavy bowed spectacles, said Mrs. Reese. There is a very wise man, and his name is Mr. Comstock, who says that nature must have been in a joking mood when she made these little tree and leaf hoppers. They are so impish and knowing looking. Ah, they are the naughty brownies of the insect world. Betty, Betty, called Mrs. Reese, your popcorn is burning. Mother, I don't care to pop any more. Let me just listen now. What makes them bad? Well, they are born with a naughty desire to suck everything they can get their tiny sucking beaks upon. They hop around in great numbers on the fruit trees and pierce the leaves with their sharp beaks. Then, with a tube-like lower lip, they suck up the sap. They also make slits in the twigs in which to lay their eggs. In the following spring, the eggs hatch and there is a fresh supply of tree hoppers ready to begin the mischief their parents left off only when they died. And what is the difference between the leaf hoppers and the tree hoppers? asked Mr. Reese. Not much. They are cousins. Cousins in naughtiness. The leaf hoppers are a great nuisance. Every year they destroy from one fourth to one fifth of the grass that springs up. They also suck the sap of the rose, the grapevine, and of many grains. These sturdy fellows live during the winter by hiding under the rubbish in the fields and vineyards, ready when the warm spring does come to begin their naughty work. What makes a little fellow like this able to do so much damage? asked Jimmy, who had come in, his hands all stained with chemicals. Well, it is well covered by this horny substance called chitin, and then it is very active. You see, the chitin acts both as armour plate for the soft parts and also as a firm support to the many muscles. As many as 2,000 separate tiny muscles have been counted in a certain caterpillar. That shows how very active insects are. And they all have such big eyes they can see everything said Betty. So they have. Bigger eyes than the old wolf of the story had. You remember I told you about the thousands of facets in the big eyes of the darning needle? Not contented with these large eyes, most insects have three small eyes, arranged in the form of a triangle on the front of the head. This bug has feelers too, said Jimmy. So it has. Insects use these feelers, or antennae, for all sorts of purposes. Some for touch, some for smell, some for hearing. Ants exchange greetings by touching antennae, and recognise a friend or enemy by the odour. The antennae of a male mosquito are covered with fine hairs. When Mrs. Mosquito sings, all the tiny hairs on Mr. Mosquito's feelers are set in motion and he becomes aware of Mrs. Mosquito. Mrs. Reese laughed. That's a new kind of romance. Mother, what's a romance? asked Betty. You'll know, dear, in time. Notice this imp's mouth, said the guide. It's made for sucking, but there's a great difference in the mouths of insects. Some are made for biting, some for lapping, some for piercing and some for sucking. The butterfly, which lives on nectar in the depths of the flowers, has a long coiled tube which scientists call a proboscis. This it unrolls and buries in the throat of the flower. Mrs. Mosquito has a file and pump, for it is she and not her husband who does all the singing and biting. The male mosquito has nothing more than a mouth for sucking nectar. 
and I told you about the biting jaws of the locust with which it nibbles grass and leaves. And does the tree hopper breathe the way the locust does, through those pores on the side? Yes, child, said the old man, and the air pores are protected by fine hairs which surround the openings, just the way the hairs in your nostrils keep the dust from getting up your nose and into your throat. Things in the bugs, said Betty, are so like us. The world becomes more and more like one great hole as you grow older, added Benjile. Those are interesting elves I've been telling you about, aren't they? I didn't know bug elves could be so interesting. Now run and get us some of the fresh cake Lizzie has been baking, said Mrs. Reese. I hope it will taste as good as it smells. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Little Busybodies: The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees, and Other Busybodies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Luther. Little Busybodies by Jeanette Augustus Marks. Chapter Nine: The Prize. There were two canoes going up the little river which led out from the pond. In the first were Ben Guile with Betty, Hope, and Jack. In the second, Jimmy and Peter paddled Mrs. Reese. They had trout rods, although they did not plan to fish very much, and well-filled luncheon baskets, magnifying glasses, cameras, boxes, and various other things. In two weeks they were to go on a camping expedition, and today's trip was taken chiefly to find a good place for the first night stop. The children were all excitement about the camping, which was to be the last jollity of their happy summer, and they asked so many questions about what they were to take with them, and they asked the same questions over so many times, that at last Mrs. Reese put her hands on her ears and called to the guide, who was paddling vigorously ahead. "'Well,' he called back, "'a frying-pan and an axe, and perhaps a tent.' He allowed his canoe to drop nearer Mrs. Reese's. "'What naughty children you are,' he continued, "'to bother the life out of your poor mother. "'I know of some other children, too, who are very naughty. "'I see one flying now.' "'That pretty little thing?' exclaimed Betty. "'With the gauzy wings?' "'Yes, that pretty little thing. "'Its wings have many, many veins. "'When lace-wing is a baby, and is called a larva, "'it does not look like this, "'for its jaws are strong and very sharp.' After it has eaten and grown for some time, it makes a house for itself, where it rolls up for a nap. While it's lying very still in this little house, many things are happening. What happens? asked Jack. Well, it's changing from a baby to a grown-up. And while it's growing up into an insect, it's called a pupa. Don't mistake this for papa. It does not look like your papa at all. Betty thought this was very funny, because her father was a great big man over six feet tall. After its wings are made, and it looks just like its mamma, Lace Wing crawls out of its house and flies away. "'Has it any cousins, like the locust?' asked Betty. "'Yes, it has cousins. The ant lion and caddis fly both belong to this family. But little Lace Wing, with its beautiful green body, gauzy wings, and golden eyes, is the most graceful member of the family. "'How do they live when they are babies?' asked Hope. "'When they are babies,' said Ben Guile, opening his eyes wide and speaking in a loud, deep voice, "'they go about like lions, seeking whom they may devour.' Betty was frightened. "'No, no, child,' said Mrs. Reese, "'not a real lion.' "'Just an aphis lion,' explained the guide, his eyes twinkling. They're called aphis lions, because they're very cruel to those little green plant lice I told you about. You remember, the plant lice live on plants, and with their sucking beaks, pump the sap from the plants. The aphis lions, crawling over the plants, come across the little aphid. Quick as a wink, they stick their sharp claws in the soft body of the plant louse, and drink the blood with their sharp-pointed jaws. They're very fond of eggs, too, 
and Mama Lacewing is careful of her eggs, because she knows the mischievous ways of her children. "'What does Mama Lacewing do with her eggs?' inquired Mrs. Reese. "'Each egg, which she lays, has a tiny stem, and the stems are fastened to a leaf or a twig. When the babies hatch out, they crawl down onto the leaf and hunt around for something to eat. Perhaps, if they knew more, they would crawl up the little egg stems and eat their own brothers and sisters. "'Oh, what cannibals!' cried Betty. "'Yes, it is not pleasant, this Fiji island of the insects, but it is their nature.' "'They do seek their meat from God,' murmured Mrs. Reese. "'Yes, it is a mystery,' answered the old man. "'But dear me, I've forgotten my story. "'Well, in about ten days they find a nicely sheltered spot "'and spin a little silken cocoon about themselves. "'In this they stay for a couple of weeks, "'while they are changing into grown-up lace wings. "'When they're finished, they cut a round door in their silken house, "'spread their gauzy wings, stretch their delicate green bodies, "'rub their eyes in wonder at the sunny world, "'and fly away to lay some little eggs on slender stems, "'just like those which their mothers laid, and from which they came.' See, said Jimmy, what a place for camping. But it's too near home, objected Peter. We could get here in two hours. So we could, admitted Jimmy. Tell us something about the cousin, sir, said Jack. We can't have much more now, replied the guide, for we shall have to stop for luncheon soon. But I'll tell you about a little fellow called the ant lion. Along the side of almost any country path or road, if you keep your eyes open, you may notice some day little pits of sand with sloping sides, and down at the bottom of this is a hole. The hole is very dark, and unless you look sharply, you'll think it just a hole. But if you examine it, you'll see a little head and two sharp little curved jaws. These are the jaws of the ant lion, lying in wait to gobble up the first passerby. The rest of the body is in a little tunnel, burrowed out in the sand. They get their name, I suppose, because they think an ant an excellent dinner. They lie there, knowing very well that Mr. and Mrs. Ant will surely slip on the steep sloping sides, and, if by any chance they don't, these ant lions have been seen to throw up sand with their heads in order to hit a helpless little ant and knock it down into the pit. The children exclaimed at this cleverness. After it has eaten its fill, this cruel, greedy fellow makes a little room for itself, out of fine grains of sand, firmly held together with silky fibers. In this room it lies quietly, sometimes all winter, until it changes into a grown-up ant-lion, with four long, narrow wings. Then Mrs. Ant-Lion lays her eggs in the sand, and when the young ones hatch out, they build the pits of destruction which I told you about. What book is it, children, that uses the pit of destruction so often as a figure? The Bible, shouted Peter, who was the minister's son in Rangeley Village. Good. Now, no more for the present, and here we are, at a splendid place for luncheon. Clear spring, dry ground, handy wood and all. The canoe beached noiselessly on the river's edge. The boys jumped out with a whoop, and soon luncheon and frying pans were out of the canoes, and there was the sound of the axe chopping the dry wood, the good smell of smoke, and the sizzling of bacon. Betty and Hope went for water. The boys fetched wood. Mrs. Reese and the guide took care of the luncheon, Mrs. Reese spreading the table on the ground, and the guide frying the potatoes and bacon. "'Oh, mother,' said Jimmy, "'what does make things taste so good out of doors?' "'I'm sure I don't know.' "'And mother,' asked Betty, what does make everything so pretty? You ask Mother a hard question. And oh, Mrs. Reese, exclaimed Jack, his thin, eager face shining with excitement. Everything in the world is so wonderful. It's all so different in the winter, said Peter, in between bites of bread and butter. It isn't half so nice. But I suppose it would be lovely if we could have you and Mr. Guile. "'You dear child!' "'It's about three miles above here,' the guide spoke. 
on the last of the Dead River Ponds, where we shall find our first camping ground. I want you to look at it. And we'll be gone days and days. Goody, goody, cried Betty, clapping her hands. And we'll sleep out of doors, cook out of doors, and do everything out of doors. Everyone smiled with her, for there was not a person there who was not looking forward with happiness to this trip. Before we start, I'll smoke my pipe, said the old man. Then, please, sir, won't you tell us something else? asked Betty. Why, I have nothing left in my head, you child. Oh, please, sir, you said there was another cousin, called the caddis worm. So I did, said the old man. Fetch me that stone, Jack. He pointed to a stone lying in the water. Jack brought it to him, and he broke something off from it. What's that? That's a stick, answered Betty. Nope. That's not a stick. That's a caddis worm. This little fellow, unlike some spoiled children I know, has to find its own dinner, change its own clothes, tuck itself into bed, and build its own house. And it's brighter than some children I know, said the old man, looking kindly at Peter. A caddis worm builds itself different kinds of houses. Some of the houses are shaped like the horns you blow on the Fourth of July. And one kind of house is made of the finest sand fastened together with bands of finest silk, which the caddis spins. Our caddis worm has patience, said the old man, shaking his head and looking at Jimmy. Patience, plenty of patience. He puffed away at his pipe for a few seconds. Some build rougher houses, choosing small pebbles instead of sand. Of these, it builds a long tube. Others, make a little green summer cottage with twigs, grasses, and pine needles, from which they build an attractive bungalow by laying down four pieces and crossing the ends like this. A hash mark. These cottages are built about an inch long, and in them the young caddis worms have a cool and cozy summer home. Often these little houses have silken hangings inside. The little owners fasten the hooks at the ends of their bodies to these and moor themselves securely. "'What do you call it a worm for?' asked Mrs. Reese. "'Well, it looks a little like a worm. "'It has a long, slender body. "'But it has six-jointed legs, which real worms don't have. "'See this fellow?' "'Ben Guile pulled the worm out of its case. "'Oh, see! Part of the body is so pale and soft.' "'That, child, is because it's always covered by the little house. "'The front end and the legs, however, are darker.' That sunburn, I suppose. When young Mr. Caddisworm goes out for a swim or a walk, it pushes its six legs out of doors and walks along, carrying its house with it. Very convenient, you see. No doors to lock. And if it gets tired, it does not have to walk home. It just walks in and goes to sleep under a nice smooth stone. Some roam about, some stay at home. These creatures are pretty much like human beings in their ways. One of the young caddis worms prefers fishing to walking, like some other young fellows I know. On a stone near its house, it spins a fine web turned upstream, so that any tender little insects floating downstream get lodged in it. An easy way to get your dinner, just to go to a net and eat. The guide paused for a long time, clouds of smoke circling about his white beard and white hair. The children thought he would never go on. "'I've had something on my mind for days,' he said, "'and I'll speak of it now. "'The boy or girl who learns the most about the ants "'before September 15th shall win a prize. "'This prize is to be a magnifying glass, "'a book of colored plates of the insects, "'very beautiful and very big, "'and a five-dollar gold piece.' "'A prize! A prize!' shouted the children, jumping madly about, while Mrs. Reese and the guide smiled at each other. "'Now we've had our dinner, our rest, our pipe of peace, a plan for a prize, and we must push on for the camping ground. Get the canoes ready!' And, with laughter and talking, the canoes were off up the river again. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of Little Busybodies. 
the life of crickets, ants, bees, and other busybodies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Busybodies by Jeanette Augustus Marks. Chapter 10 A Nagging Family Flies and Mosquitoes. Do you know of a family around here whom no one likes? asked Ben Guile. The lanterns were burning brightly out on the lawn of Turtle Lodge, and Mrs. Reese had just stopped playing so that the children might rest from dancing. All the lanterns moved gently to and fro in the piazza. The children were running about, and everybody seemed to be having a wonderful and breathless time. Do you know of a family around here? called the guide, whom nobody likes. I do replied Mrs. Reese, laughing and slapping the side of her face. They are just like some people, nagging, annoying, and numerous. Do any children here? called Ben Guile for the third time. No of a family nobody likes. For the child who guesses, I have a pocket knife. The Smiths! shouted Peter. My father says Mrs. Smith is always quarreling with the choir. Hush! said Mrs. Reese, seeing danger ahead. Ben means a family right here on the piazza. The children looked at one another, and then Jack turned shrewdly to the guide. I guess, sir, it's mosquitoes and flies. Good boy, and here's the knife. Jack thought he had never seen such a wonderful knife. It had three blades, a corkscrew, a file, and a pair of scissors, and to this day Jack has that knife. Come, said Mrs. Reese, let us all sit down for a few minutes while Lizzie is getting supper ready inside. How many wings? asked Mrs. Reese. Has a fly. Four, answered Jimmy. No, corrected the guide. A real fly has only two wings. In the place of the second pair, they have a queer little knobbed rods which are called balancers. Something like the outriggers on your skull, Jim. These steer and steady the fly's body. What makes a fly bite? asked Hope. They do not bite, child. A beetle or a grasshopper can really bite, because beetles and grasshoppers have heavy, horny jaws, toothed on the edge, with which to do it. But a fly has fine, sharp, pointed jaws. With these needle-like jaws they pierce a hole in the skin. Then with a tiny sucking beak, made by the rolled lower lip, they draw up the blood through this opening. I wonder whether any little girl here knows why flies should not be allowed in the house, asked Mrs. Reese. No little girl did know anything except that their mothers were always driving flies out, and these creatures buzzed and were a nuisance. Do tell them, said Mrs. Reese. Well, said the guide, the fly is such a little acrobat, it can crawl up the steepest and most slippery wall and walk upside down or right side up with the greatest ease. Perhaps some day you can make a fly keep still long enough so that you can look at its foot. At the end of the foot are two little round pads thickly covered with downy hair. On each side are two sharp claws and many stiff clinging hairs. With this flattened foot it can go wherever it wishes. But this same little foot is the chief reason why a fly should never be allowed in a house, for flies crawl into all sorts of dirty places, and the fine hairs catch and hold the dirt. When the flies light on us or on the table, some of the pieces of dirt are shaken off. But they're so hard to catch, said Betty. It takes Lizzie forever and forever to get them out of the dining room in the morning. I know why they are hard to catch, added Jack. For I've looked at a dead fly. They have such big eyes like lighthouses they can see all around. Yes, said Ben Guile. There is no such thing as creeping up on a fly unawares. Flies are dirty creatures, continued the old man, and the time is not very far distant when people will make war on them just as they do on mosquitoes. Mrs. Fly lays her eggs in unclean places, and as many as a hundred eggs at a time. These eggs hatch out quickly. It takes only twenty-one days to make a chicken out of an egg, but to make a baby fly, it takes only a few hours, and ugly babies they are, little white maggots or worms that live and feed and grow rapidly in dirty places. Within six days the maggots become a tiny, 
dark brown pupa, and after five days the pupa hatches out into a grown-up fly. A dozen little girls at the party made up their minds promptly that after this evening they, at least, would make war on flies. And aren't flies of any use? asked Betty. There is one little fly, Mrs. Tachina Fly, who is of some use. She is the cousin of the house fly. She is of use because she chooses a queer place to lay her eggs, on the back of a young caterpillar. After these caterpillars grow and shut themselves up into the cocoon to change into a butterfly, the little fly eggs hatch out into maggots. Of course, they're hungry, all babies are, and finding the nice fat caterpillar in the round house like dutiful babies, they eat what is set before them until the fat, tender caterpillar is eaten up. After they are satisfied, they lie still in the brown skin and change into grown-up tachina flies. And at last out come a lot of busy, buzzing, bothersome flies. It is rather hard on the caterpillar, but when we think what harmful, greedy things most caterpillars are, perhaps it is good that there are tachina flies to eat them. Is it time for supper yet? No, not yet, replied Mrs. Reese. Do tell the children something about mosquitoes. If I had to choose between Mr. and Mrs. Mosquito, I should take Mr. Mosquito, for he neither bites nor buzzes, but attends strictly to his own business. Perhaps he thinks Mrs. Mosquito's voice pretty. Perhaps he likes to hear about her adventures. But most people do not, for they think Mrs. Mosquito a busybody, always going where she is not wished, always breaking up conversations, and always coming back after she has been plainly told that she is not wanted. Yet her singing is music in the ears of her husband. Perhaps if we had long, slender antenna all covered with hairs like his, we too might like her song. When she sings, these hairs begin to tremble, to vibrate, and a little nerve in the antenna changes this trembling to sound. In every way, Mr. Mosquito seems a more pleasant body. He eats very little and contents himself with nectar. But she, knowing that excitement makes the blood flow faster and being a hearty eater, begins her song gently at first, then louder and louder, nearer and nearer. Finally, with her long, slender, sharp stylets, she makes a hole in your cheek or your arm, pushes in her sucking beak, and pumps up the blood. And there she sucks and sucks until her stomach is full or she is brushed off or killed. Where do mosquitoes lay eggs? asked Jack who was certain that everything in the insect world did lay eggs, as indeed everything does. In the water. Any puddle will do. When the eggs hatch out, they are funny-looking fellows, long, tapering bodies with a big head end. At the other end are two little prongs. This baby, like some other babies, is never quiet, but squirms and wriggles so that it's called a wriggler. Upon its thick head are two little tufts of hair. These it waves every moment so that all the food which comes its way will go into its hungry little mouth. One of the prongs at the other end of the body is an air tube, so that the baby mosquito has to stand on its head to breathe. It hangs head downward and holds its air tube above the surface of the water. When people pour kerosene upon the water, the wriggler cannot get any air to breathe and therefore dies. Within a few days, the wriggler changes its skin three times, after the third change, it looks very different and is called a pupa. Now, instead of having an air tube at the end, it has two on the back of the thorax. At the tail end are two flaps to help it swim. Even the pupa is never still a minute, but holds its air tubes above the water's surface. When anything comes to disturb it, it uses its flaps and swims safely to the bottom of the pool. At the end of two days, out of the pupa skin comes a grown-up mosquito. If it is a Mrs. Mosquito, she promptly begins to bite people and to carry about fevers or malaria from person to person. The bite of a mosquito may sometimes be as dangerous as the bite of a rattlesnake. The children had been slapping the mosquitoes buzzing about on the piazza. And now, said the guide, before we go into supper, I will tell you a real and true story. Mosquitoes sometimes carry sickness from one person to another until it spreads throughout a large city. We didn't realize how dangerous mosquitoes were till a short time ago. People had malaria and were very ill with it. In some countries, many died. 
every one thought however that the malaria came in some mysterious way from the mist of the low-lying swamps and marshes but one day some one happened to think it might not be in the marshes after all rather that it might be a certain little two-winged insect with a short piercing instrument which spent its babyhood days in these same marshes and so two english doctors determined to find out the truth of the matter in the faraway land of italy was a place where thousands of people were suffering from this disease there these doctors went and built a comfortable little house in the very worst place they could find they were careful to screen every door and window and to leave not a crack for a mosquito to crawl in there they lived always going into the house at sundown shutting all the screen doors but allowing the damp night air to pour in it was this night air which everyone supposed gave people malaria but the two physicians in the snug little house free from mosquitoes kept well strong and happy although the people outside in the other houses were very ill and suffering with chills and fever you see these little anopheles for that is their name bite someone ill with malaria perhaps the next person they stab with their sharp needle as well in this way they leave some of the poison blood in the wound there is another illness which is a hundred times worse than malaria this is called yellow fever in some countries thousands of people die from this every year and doctors did not know just how it was carried from place to place our government appointed a commission to study the matter dr walter reed a surgeon of the united states army with three assistants went to havana and built a house carefully screened just like that of the english physicians in italy people thought that the fever was carried in the clothes and on the sheets of those who were ill to prove that this was not so these men wore the clothes of sick people and even slept on the sheets taken from the sick bed they did this disagreeable thing for twenty days keeping the little house very warm and shutting out the fresh air and sunshine but in spite of all these things the men continued well and strong they wanted to prove even more surely that it was a certain kind of mosquito which really did the harm so they built another house everything in this house was pure and clean the rooms were flooded with fresh air and sunshine half of the house was carefully screened and shut off from the other half the men in the half that was screened kept perfectly well those in the other half let themselves be bitten by mosquitoes which had been in the houses where there was yellow fever all became dangerously ill with the fever two of these brave physicians died of the fever while trying to find the cause in order that they might save the lives of thousands of people that is modern heroism said mrs reese and service of the highest sort all humanity is indebted to those brave men there is no doubt but that our panama canal could not be in progress today were it not for the extermination of the mosquito in the canal zone since we can never tell where a mosquito has been or what kind of a mosquito it is i suppose it is best to keep mosquitoes from biting and always to keep them out of the house and now children supper is ready and after that games let us go to the dining room End of chapter 10